first of all, thanks uh, DCO and, and the organizer of this meeting to give me the opportunity to present my work at this very last meeting. Um, I'm very happy about that. I think that metamorphic degassing of abiotic methane at convergent margins is something very, very important to our community. Um, the session is about quantities and movements of deep carbon, but I really think that this topic is important to all the DCO communities. Deep energy, of course, it's methane, it's energy. Deep life, um, extreme chemistry and physics, and um, reservoir and fluxes. It's very important to all of us and all the DCO communities are concerned. There is just a very small psychological barrier to overcome. It is that there is absolutely no methane in subduction zones according to our models. All models we have are based on CO2. There's just CO2, always, always CO2. Um, <laughs> and I have colleagues saying that, yes, but this is just a proxy for carbon. It has no sense to me. It's like saying that there is 40% quartz in olivine. It has no sense. Um, the problem is that this affects uh, strongly our everyday observations in the field, for example, and back in the lab, our interpretations and our new budgets, because we are looking for these CO2 and processes uh, capable to produce CO2 in subduction zones. Obviously, there is methane in subduction zones, and potentially a lot, but the problem is that we uh, do not have a clear picture about these fluxes, how this methane forms, how these fluxes uh, potentially overlap with these CO2 fluxes, we, we just don't know. So this is not just a control, but is most likely a bias. So I would like to uh, start with the very important contribution that DCO scientists uh, have provided to, to this topic over the last decade from both uh, experimental and natural samples uh, studies, and then move to a brief summary of what we know about the processes, the uh, signatures, and the fluxes of this deep abiotic methane at convergent margins, and conclude with uh, an example of very unexpected side effects of these processes at depth. Experimental results, the DCO decades have, has witnessed very important experimental results on this topic. Just a few examples. PT limits of deep hydrocarbon th synthesis by calcium carbonate uh, aqueous reduction. Redox effects on calcite portland light, portland light fluid equilibria at 4R conditions. And then immiscible hydrocarbon fluids in the deep carbon cycle. This is very important because almost for the first time, we have an idea about how these gases form, their stability field, and their speciation at subduction zone conditions. And I wanted to show you just one example that is, it has been very important for me as a field geologist and metamorphic petrologist. These are immiscible hydrocarbon fluids in aqueous, uh, uh, sorry, hydrocarbons in aqueous fluids at high pressure and, and temperature conditions consistent with uh, what metamorphic rocks experience in subduction zones. What you see here are small droplets of immiscible hydrocarbons. So when, this is very important to me as a field geologist because when I'm in the field and trying to figure out how these fluids form, uh, how they move in deep rocks in very small pores at very high pressure conditions, it's very hard. And this uh, has given me a picture of about how they are at depth. This is very important. And just keep this image in mind for the next slide. Then natural samples. In this case, it's not just if, for example, methane or other hydrocarbons are stable, but also the fact that they are stable. They exist at depth. One example is our uh, 
paper about massive production of abiotic methane in ultramafic rocks at blue spaces conditions, so about 40 kilometers depth. And another one, very important one, about hydrocarbon formation in mafic rocks in, in China, in Tianshan, China. And when we have the opportunity to look inside the rocks and, and, and see how these gases formed, what we find is that they are immiscible. This is just an example of two coexisting fluids trapped in two different coexisting fluid inclusion populations. One is methane and hydrogen, the other one is methane, hydrogen, and water. So this is just the natural expression of this. It makes sense, and this has been a huge achievement for us, again, from a field perspective, and I think also for the lab. Then the question is, are these gases, is, is this methane common? Is this, is this relevant or just something uh, strange in subduction zones? And I can tell you that it is common. These are examples of methane hydrogen rich fluids from different uh, metamorphic belts around the world that tells to us that it is not just common, but it has accompanied subduction over geological timescales mountain belts with very different ages. So it is relevant. And all these methane-rich fluids could have formed through the combination of different carbon and hydrogen sources, which are very diverse at depth in subduction zones. Carbon from subducted carbonates, or graphitic carbon, or fluid-deposited graphite, or carbonates. Then dehydration fluids, produced or equilibrated with different rock types at depth, sediments, oceanic crust, ultramafic rocks, and so on and so on, or hydration fluids produced at depth from, for example, uh, deep serpentinization processes. So there's a huge combination of, of um, sources for these deep fluids, and of course a wide range of potential processes to produce deep abiotic methane, and signatures, and fluxes. I'm gonna show you some examples of these uh, processes, signatures, and, and fluxes. Carbonate reduction appears to be probably the most common uh, process at depth. And once again, during the DCO decade, several papers have uh, shown evidence for this process at depth. The first one, or the first three papers about this topic investigated the uh, reduction of carbonate in marbles in contact with serpentinites at blue sheet spaces conditions, about 40 kilometers depth. This is a special case because there is clear evidence for reduction, but there's, there's no, no evidence for methane degassing. The carbon budget across this reaction zone is perfectly balanced, so the carbonate goes into graphite with any carbon loss, so no methane degassing. This is a special case. Then, again, our paper, the, the, the process is slightly different in our interpretation. This is percolation of hydrogen-rich fluids into uh, carbonated ultramafic rocks and production of large amounts of methane. This is, all these uh, bubbles are methane-rich. And again, this very important example from China, this is reduction of carbonate in mafic eclogites. This is important because mafic eclogites are the keyword of subduction zone metamorphism. So having methane produced in this rock is very important to change, uh, at least in part, our mind about the fluid being produced at depth. Okay, second process, we don't know much about it, is graphite hydrogenation. We propose this process as a side process in the alpine um, reduced uh, carbonated ultramafic rocks. This is fluid deposited graphite here in black, this is methane and hydrogen fluids being produced at some stage during the evolution. We think that at least part of this methane could have been produced through uh, graphite hydrogenation. This kind of reaction is considered to be very slug sluggish, sluggish at low pressure and temperature conditions, but we don't know if it is more efficient at high pressure and temperature conditions. This is a video of uh, the um, DFDMD uh, simulations Pauline Buckley has been doing. Um, and you can see, can I start it again? Yes. You can see that 
uh, hydrogen and, and graphite react together and at some stage, puff, some methane is formed. We are still working on this simulation to estimate the rates of these reactions. It's gonna take a little bit of time, but this kind of reaction is possible. Then the reducing agent, we have to produce methane and having hydrogen rich fluids is very important. There might be many processes, but I think that the most important one is deep serpentinization. So it's the equivalent of what we know at seafloor conditions or in ophiolites, but happening at great depth. And we have examples of this. I presented a poster, poster yesterday. This is serpentinization of olivine rocks in, in the subducting slabs of the, of the Western Alps. And uh, there is serpentine forming along cracks, exactly the same patterns as low temperature serpentinization. And together with Dmitry Zvergensky, we have modeled these reactions at high pressure and temperature conditions, and we see exactly what we need. The FO2 decreases during the water-rock interaction, and a lot of hydrogen and, 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 and methane, if some carbon is there, can form. And once again, we can couple this kind of modeling with natural samples. These are just two examples from uh, tectonic units uh, that went down to one GPA and two GPA, fluid inclusions, and what we find in the fluid inclusion is a lot of methane and hydrogen here and there, but this methane and hydrogen are not alone. There is ethane, there is H2S, and there is also ammonia, which has never been found in uh, geological fluids, especially at depth. And look at the composition of these fluid inclusions. Hydrogen, methane, H2S, ammonia. This is almost everything deep life needs to exist and survive. And everything is in deep fluid inclusions. This is great. Signatures, this is very simple, unknown. We know uh, this kind of discrimination based on delta 13C of methane and, 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 and delta D. We know that it is it doesn't always work, but it provides some, at least some, some, some insight with abiotic gases being here and biotic gases there. And we wanted to play with this kind of, of, of um, uh, classification. We have the gases, we crushed the samples and extracted the gases, and our very first result uh, plots here is not even on the diagram. So these gases are exotic compared to what we are used to uh, observe and measure at low pressure conditions. There is a lot of work to be done on these rocks. The extraction is not simple at all. So uh, I think that the DCO legacy will help in the future. We have done the same thing with other samples from uh, different uh, localities with different techniques. Alps, this is also the Alps and this is a, a very nice example from, from the US. And you can see that there is a quite uh, large range of uh, delta 13 C signatures of this meth methane, and this probably reflects different sources and, 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 and potentially processes at depth. Of course, the next step is going to be uh, uh, the clamped isotope technique. This is not simple. We need to extract a lot of gas. Then fluxes, unconstrained. We don't know anything about the fluxes. We are still trying to compile a list of potential processes. But what I can say, this is based on my feelings and, and what, I can, uh, what I have studied in the natural sample, is that they could be very large. And we need a bottom-up approach. We need to define how this methane forms, how it evolves at depth, and also how it affects other carbon reservoirs. At this brings uh, us to the uh, last slide that is about unexpected results or effects. This is a sentence uh, taken from this, I, I think, very important paper um, that says, low FO2 may amplify the already significant enhancement of calcite solubility by pressure and temperature. So this basically means that if we have a very reduced fluids inf fluid infiltrating a carbonate rock, the potential to dissolve and mobilize carbon is enhanced. How does it work in natural sample? This is a carbonated uh, serpentinite. All the white stuff is carbonate, and there is no reduction in this sample. Delta-13C of the bulk rock is about one per mil. So 
nothing special, no reduction. And this is what happens when a, a hydrogen methane rich fluid percolates through the rock. A strong channelization, the delta 13C of carbonate goes from 1 to 12%. This means a lot of methane production. And you can also see that this zone here is highly strained, so a lot of deformation. So this is not just methane generation, but also strain localization. And Francesco Giuntoli has done a very careful job in characterizing these shear zones and obtained estimates from, for the strain rates along these shear zones and got velocity that are, that are not so different from seismic velocity. So there might be very unexpected side effects during the evolution and migration of these fluids at depth. In conclusion, we don't know much about this deep methane. We know that it is down there, and uh, it is not present in our models. This is something that we have to fix. I think this is very important for our community. Deep methane is not alone. Other hydrocarbons and potentially important species are there, too. The range of signatures is potentially large, and could overlap with other sources, so the detection of these gases at shallower depth could be very challenging. Fluxes are unconstrained, but potentially very large, and again, this is very deep energy. We should care about these fluxes. And unexpected side effects uh, on carbon mobility and dynamics of subduction zones uh, may also be important. This is what I would like to develop in a project. Uh, I don't know if this project is going to be funded one day, but I would really like to thank the DCO for the support with a very nice letter. And I want to leave you with this announcement. We will uh, have the next Serpentine Days next year in Sestri Levante, Italy. Many DCO scientists are involved. We have very uh, nice plans for those who like serpentinides and oficarbonates, and we also have nice plans for those who don't like <laughs> serpentinides and oficarbonates. So if you're interested in, please visit the website or come to me for details. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Alberto. Uh, we have time for one quick question. Thanks, Alberto. That was really fun. Uh, one of the things that happened at the very first deep carbon meeting is we had one group of scientists who rather provocatively said 100% of all hydrocarbons are biological. And, and another group said, to contrast that, 100% are abiological. Do you have any sense or does anybody in the room now have a feeling that it's someplace in the middle, it's not 100% one or the other, but do you have any just intuitive feeling yourself about what percentage this might represent? I have no idea. <laughs> and, and to be honest, I, I, I would like to stay in the middle and share thoughts on both sides, but I think that the, 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 the important um, message of what I've been doing on these uh, systems is that we are not considering the potentially largest source of purely abiotic gases on Earth, that is subduction. There's nothing. If you check all the papers about abiotic methane on Earth, subduction is never mentioned. So maybe it's not going to explain all the uh, uh, oil reservoirs and everything. But just give it a try. Great. Thank you very much. And Thanks in the interest of time, we'll move on to our next speaker.